today we're going to be doing an urban sketch for beginners using this and these. So if you are looking how to get started in ink and watercolour, you're in the right place. Let's see what we can do together. So all we're doing is a really simple sketch using these watercolours. We just use a few of the pigments and I'll tell you as I use them which pigments we're using. I've got one brush, size 10 round brush, and I've got one fountain pen with this, a fine nib fountain pen with some waterproof ink in. Um, this paper is cold pressed paper, uh, lovely light watercolour texture to it. And you can find everything I'm using listed on my website, urbansketch.co.uk forward slash supplies. And with that, let's get started. This is step one. And what do we say? Step one, step one is shapes. So what we're trying to do is identify the key shapes in the scene. And the key shapes in this scene are these two characterful houses. And what are they? They're basically rectangles. So we can just come down and start drawing two rectangles underneath that line, which just sets out the, um, the roof line. When we're drawing our big shapes, it can be helpful to remember to leave space for little shapes. So we've left a little space for the door there, for example. And notice how these lines, I'm, I'm wobbling them. Notice how the the house itself is wobbly. It's not a series of straight lines. It's got texture, it's got age, it's got character. So with our line work, we don't think about stiff, hard lines. We think about wobbly, fun, loose lines, which represent that character. And that also makes things flexible for the future. And it's really important, I think, as a beginner, to understand these ideas, to understand that a hard, stiff line isn't actually going to be as easy to do as a lovely loose line and it will restrict what you can do, restrict the changes you can make later. Having done the big shapes we start moving into the, the smaller shapes, the little shapes, the, the windows, they're just rectangles. Got this funny little crack running through the building which kind of nicely links into our window. You might notice the window is not in perfect proportion. There's too much gap between the top of the roof and the window as well. But that's okay. You know, the, the key thing, one of the key things at least that I learned quite early on in my sketching career is it doesn't have to look exactly like the scene. We're making art. We're making our own decisions. So let's make our own decisions. And when we make mistakes, let's just own them as our decisions as well. That's the humanity and the character that we get in our art. The roof, it's basically a rectangle. It's got slightly wobbly sides. It's got a sag to the top, but really it's just a rectangle. So Again, we can make things simple, make things easy for ourselves. You might notice as well that I'm sort of dotting around the image, finding a shape here, a shape there. Well, that's my way of working. I think if you end up focusing too much in one place, you get over-focused, you overdo it in that place, and you miss out important parts of the scene elsewhere. If Instead, if we keep moving around gently, we can find all the little details bit by bit, not all at once, bit by bit, like drawing in these door frames, which we could just treat as basically a shape, we just drew a rectangle around a rectangle. Um, and in doing so, we started to really resolve the more challenging, smaller, more difficult parts of our scene. The windows, they're potentially complicated, aren't they? But let's break it down. So within each big window, we have two sort of medium sized windows, which are more rectangles. So don't draw the frames, don't try and draw the frames, instead draw the shapes, those big rectangular shapes. Within those medium rectangles we have little rectangles. Now instead of drawing these at all, I'm going to apply really fine hatch marks. Now what we're doing is we're not drawing a shape, but we're suggesting a shape with darkness, with value. And this is again, it's just more flexible. If we draw a hard outline well, if we get it wrong, we've got it wrong and it's obvious. If we suggest loosely some tonal value, well, we've only suggested it. We haven't got it wrong. We're leaving it up to the viewer to pick out. And I think as you watch these windows develop, for me, they're very effective. We don't need to specifically draw things. We can leave them loose like this and actually it will work better. The more we try and draw, the more room there is for us to go wrong, to make mistakes, to overdo things. If we just leave things loose, well, it works out brilliantly in my in my humble opinion. It's just so much more reliable, enjoyable, and relaxing. 
And I just continue these ideas as well throughout different windows, throughout different parts of the scene. Because if you use an idea in one place, it's easier for the viewer to just understand it if you've used it elsewhere. I now want to start thinking about really little shapes. And I suppose we could call this kind of step two, couldn't we? We've done the big shapes. Now we've moved on to textures and things like that. And so there's lots of little brick marks and things like that. Little brick marks on, on above this roof, little crack marks next to the window, which we didn't finish off. And then lots of little uh, bricks on the left as well. And these tiny little textural marks actually add a huge amount of character. We don't need to draw every brick. We can draw six, seven, eight bricks in a whole building. And that would be more effective than if we fill that building with ink, overwork it and just make it look horrible and messy. Down below, there's that lovely mark of darkness. Well, we can get that in with our ink again, using this same idea of hatching, just to make things all aligned, all neatly the same for our viewer. So we've used the same techniques and effects throughout our sketch. We've not done a million different things in a million different ways. There's lovely shadows under the eaves of the house as well. And again, let's just use this same simple, loose light idea of hatching and We'll join everything up. It will just all start to work together. And we don't need to overdo things. We don't need to work too hard. We just work gently, softly, and it will come together. Sometimes when we've done lots of hatching, and it's the same after watercolours, it can be good just to make the original line a little bolder to make it really stand out. Make sure we haven't lost it and lost our structure. What the, the roof could do with a few little tiles as well. So little tile marks on the roof. And we're pretty much done with our building. I think at this stage, we don't want to overdo things. You can always add more, but you can't take anything away. So we will just have a little step back and think, what else does our, our cute little scene need to feel complete? What else does it need to feel complete? Well, a little bit of a surround. So we've got this green on the on the right, little tree on the right. On the left, we can just suggest, very gently suggest this little house on the left. This means it's no longer just a building in isolation. This building has friends, but we are focusing on our focal point, which is the building itself. Equally, this pavement in front is quite important because at the moment, our building's just floating, which is nonsense, isn't it? As soon as we give it a an edge, something in front, we can start to understand the context. It starts to sit down on the ground and it just makes sense instead of making nonsense. A few little textures on that pavement just to give people a clear idea of what, what it is, this shape is entailing, what it really means. And like that, well, our, our ink work is basically done. We can come back later if we want. We can come back if we want, but we don't have to, not at all. So what's next? Of course, step. Well, normally this is step two, but I sort of snuck in a step two, didn't I, with the little shapes. So let's call this one today. We'll call this step three. Step three is identifying some key colours. Now, the first colour, I really like this door. <laughs> so I'm jumping in with some green gold into this door because I just thought I want this colour in and I think I might be able to understand a little bit better after I've done it, the other colours I need. That's my excuse for doing the door first today anyway. Um, so we've got some green gold on the door and now we need to decide what colour our houses are going to be. Now the one on the left is sort of orangey. Well it's my sketch so now I'm going to make it quite orange. This is quinacridone sienna, lovely rich warm orange colour. I'm not going to colour the whole house in though. This is another really key learning point for beginners. You don't need to colour everything in. In fact, you probably need to not colour everything in. Similarly on the right, I'm going to take some liberties with the colour. Instead of having it white or cream, I'm going to use some Hansa yellow medium to give it that creamy light effect, but not colour everything in. And by not colouring everything in, we leave space, we leave light, we leave air on the page, and we prevent it being overworked and messy. Now I'm adding some cobalt blue into the windows on top of that little hatching. I'm using it to suggest a bit of a reflection of some sky in the windows as well. 
and you'll notice the blue is leaking into the walls. For me, that's lovely. I really like my colours mixing and mingling, and this is just the first step of colours. Watercolours are made to mingle together, they're made to be loose, they're made to create these kind of effects. And the sooner I think that we get used to that, the quicker we'll be happily, merrily sketching along and enjoying ourselves. On top of all of this, let's add a nice sky now. Now we've got the sky reflected in the windows. It just makes sense, doesn't it, to actually have that lovely blue sky. Again, this is the cobalt blue just being popped into the sky. It's a nice rich tone, really lovely saturated primary blue. How many pigments are we used at the moment? Probably about five, haven't we? We've got quinacridone sienna, we've got Hansa yellow, gold green, and we've got cobalt blue. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's just the four pigments so far. And actually, that's a really nice learning point as well for watercolours and sketching. Not to overdo it with the number of pigments. To take it carefully. And yeah, I'm probably going to use some more pigments as we go. But I don't need to feel rushed into doing so. You can take things gently. You can use your colours together to create more variation. But without using you know, 50 or 60 different pigments, to exaggerate. Obviously, you're not going to use 50 or 60. But sometimes we want something different. So here's a bit of indigo. So a bit of indigo to create some of that moodiness. And again, this is grounding our image, isn't it? By getting that curb in, we've now popped our house back on the ground. It's not floating. It's not sort of nonsensically flying away from us. Above, we can just use that same indigo, a nice dark colour, we can use to amp up that shadow and we can use some indigo and cobalt together in the windows just to double down on all this lovely reflection and why are we doing this because as you move around and you make some colors richer you you realize you might need to rebalance your image in other places and so it's important not to just think of watercolors as one layer and done no watercolors are things we continually react to we move around we respond to we see what happens getting a little bit more of my hansy yellow back on the page because i love a good road marking and now we're going to let things dry see where we're at and then respond a bit more with our next stage now you might notice the page has suddenly become paler that's because it is dry when watercolor is dry key learning point is that they become paler, less saturated. So when we add our colours in the first place, it's important not to be scared about what's happening. They will dry and they'll become pale and they'll become less punchy. It's just a normal part of watercolours. And that's why we can now layer up. We can now layer using the same colours. So this is a bit of indigo, a bit of cracked in sienna. And do you see how that layer is doubling down the intensity again? Similarly, in all those bricks and in these shadows, we layered or added bolder colours to create more variation than we can get with one layer of watercolour. So it's really important when you're learning to sketch with ink and watercolour to understand watercolour as a process. It doesn't just happen, um, but with simple processes and simple steps, it will happen. It will, will come out great. You've just got to not rush. Similarly, let's get in the front again. See how that lovely yellow has sort of split and merged. So it's time for us to go back and apply it again. Apply this time a thicker layer and we can actually get the impression of a double yellow line. We can use the same yellow again, just create a bit more variation, suggest some funky little bricks in our characterful house. And again, all we're doing, moving around gently, finding our little bits to add, our little places to enhance, but not overdoing it, leaving so much white on our page. Now this is a bit that you may or may not love. <laughs> For me, I absolutely love a few splashes. And with this being quite a simple scene, actually I just wouldn't, you know, why not have a bit of fun? Why not just go a bit mad with the splashes? Lots of yellows, oranges and blues, just to create texture and drama. Now the next thing, and the last thing I'm going to do, is what I call restructure the image. So using our pen, we talked about it earlier, how that bold line can just need to come forward again. And that's what we're doing here. We're finding the key shapes, the key textures, the dark areas, 
and just a little bit of gentle extra line work to bring those forward, to bring those back to the front of our image to create something really interesting and to make sure the image still makes sense. And again, because although watercolors are transparent, they are still going to reduce some of the intensity of our ink because they're sitting on top of it, absorbing some of the some of the colour, some of the light that would otherwise, you know, be affected by the ink instead. So we can just move around, reinvigorate, perhaps even add a few little extra details, but mostly we haven't to be restrained here. And just add in those key little touches here and there to make our image really make sense. And before you know it, you'll have done enough. And it's important to then stop. You can come back later, but you can't take away. Pop your signature on and just feel happy and proud of what you've done, however it's gone. So with that, I'm done. And what I'd love to see is you joining me in the next video. I've got another couple of beginners videos for urban sketching. And also, if you like my style, come find me on sketchloose.co.uk where I've got some really in-depth and fun courses. So thank you everyone for watching my little sketching videos. If you enjoy my content, please do subscribe to my channel because it makes me really, really happy. Thanks again.